Science! Welcome to science, everybody. This week, I'm going to start with archaeology, something really exciting from Scotland. Possibly the oldest Pictish fort has been found. In 2015, a team of archaeologists from the University of Aberdeen investigated an eroded sea stack near the site of the ruined Dunfantar Castle or Dunatar Castle in Scotland and uncovered evidence of what we believe now to be a 3rd or 4th century Pictish fort. Now, that's a lot to unpack. I actually had to look up a lot of this too because I'm not familiar with that area at all. First of all, Pictish refers to the Picts, a confederation of people who uh, lived in what today is eastern and northern Scotland during basically the late Iron Age and the early medieval periods. You probably have heard of Pictish stones or at least seen them before because they're pretty famous. They are some of the earliest and best preserved writings from the Picts and also some of the only historical record we have of these people. Um, they are broken down into three different classes. Class one is considered uh, unworked, unworked stones with symbols only and no cross on either side. And they usually date back to around the sixth, sixth century. And uh, the, one of the famous examples is I'm showing you right here is the Aber, Aberlemno Serpent Stone. I'm going to get my, my money's worth out of my mouth today. <laughs> Aberlemno Serpent Stone. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's just Pictish symbols dating around the 6th, 6th century. The class 2 of these stones is more or less a rectangular shape with a large cross and symbols on one or both sides. Now, the symbols, as well as Christian motifs, are carved in relief, and the cross with its surroundings is filled in with designs. Class 2 stones date back to about the 8th or 9th century. And a famous example of this is the Kirkland Yard Stone, which is just a few miles down the road from the Serpent Stone. Now, class three stones feature no idiomatic Pictish symbols. They can be cross slabs. They can be unmarked gravestones. They can be just freestanding crosses. Basically, archaeologists technically throw this class out at this time because most, most of them that are being found either date way later or aren't aren't linked back to Pictish at all. So that class three isn't really even utilized today. So Donfiatar Castle or Donatar Castle is literally um, Scottish Gaelic, which means fort on the shelving slope. And it's a ruined medieval fortress located upon a rocky headland on the northeastern coast of Scotland, about two miles south of, so of Stonehaven. And the ruins are absolutely breathtaking, as you can see. And the surviving buildings are largely 15th and 16th century buildings, but the site is believed to have been fortified in the early Middle Ages. And Dunatar has played a prominent role in the history of Scotland throughout the 18th century um, because of the Jacobite Risings and its strategic location and defensive strength. It's also probably best known as the place where the honors of Scotland resided. Those were the Scottish crown jewels, and they were hidden there when Oliver Cromwell and his invading army was coming in the 17th century. Now, near these ruins, on the sea stack to the left, there's new evidence that suggests that an even older place of power existed. Starting in 2015, a group of archaeologists started to piece together this old Pictish settlement and realized that this sea stack was actually much larger and once connected to the mainland. They had to get the help of mountaineers to scale the rocky outcrop, which is basically about 20 by 12 meters, very small, and is surrounded on every side by sheer drops. Despite its small size, the team led by Dr. Gordon Noble believed it would yield important archeological finds. Their initial surveys found evidence of ramparts, floors, and even hearth, and now samples found in the excavation have been carbon dated. So this suggests that the site dates from the third or fourth century, which would make it the oldest Pictish fort ever discovered. 
Dr. Noble is a senior lecturer in archaeology at the University of Aberdeen, and he described the sea stack as an exceptional archaeological find and said consistency across the samples dated meant that they could be confident it was one of the earliest fortified sites occupied by the Picts. He went on to say, this is the most extreme archaeology I've ever done. The site can only be accessed using ropes at low tide and having never climbed before, it was quite hair-raising. But the challenge of getting to the top was soon forgotten as we began to make significant discoveries. He went on to say, we, kno we knew that the site had potential as in 1832, a group of youths from Stonehaven scaled the sea stack, prompted by a local man who had recurring dreams of gold being hidden there. Unfortunately for the use, they didn't find the gold, but they did find a number of decorated Pictish symbol stones. As they were throwing them into the sea, they noticed some were also carved. Several years later, when knowledge of Pictish stones began to circulate, a number were recovered from the sea. And, you know, that just sounds like normal hoodlums just finding stuff and throwing it into the ocean, right? At least they sank right where they threw them, and they were able to be recovered later. Because the radiocarbon dates for the settlement suggest that these stones may be among the earliest in the carving tradition of Pictish stones. Remember I was saying that most class one stones date back to the 6th century, and this could be two to three centuries earlier, which is incredible. They discovered partial remains of houses on the edge of the cliff, which shows that much of the settlement had fallen into the sea. They found turf and timber structures and preserved floor layers and hearths. And some of the hearths that they found were built on top of one another, which also suggests that space was limited and likely to have been restricted on the site that these early people were building their settlement upon. The inhabitants actually had connections to the Roman world as well as a lot of pottery and glass was also found at this site. And it appears that the site was abandoned in the late 4th or 5th century and the settlement might have shifted just a little bit to the right in Donatar, which was the elite center of Pictish society in the 7th century and would go on to be Donatar Castle. Professor Noble went on to say, the new video, this new video helps to fully visualize how the fort may have looked in the 4th century, which we think helps to further bring the life to life the lives of the Picts, who are so poorly understood because of the lack of historical records. And you can see that video and a ton of other amazing stuff on the Historic Environment Scotland website, which I'll be putting the URL right here. It's historicenvironment.scot, and you can visit that today. Also, I'm going to show you that full video in full right here.
Next up on Science This Week, two new Earth mass exoplanets have been found in the habitable zone around a red dwarf. So, astronomers using the Carmenes instrument, which the scientific name of the acronym is the Keller Alto High Resolution Search for M Dwarfs with Exo Earths with Near Infrared and Optical Eschel Spectrographs. Say that five times fast. But this instrument at the Keller Alto Observatory helped astronomers find clear evidence of two potentially habitable exoplanets orbiting Tea Garden Star, the brightest and one of the nearest ultra-cool dwarf stars in the solar neighborhood. Tea Garden Star is located in the constellation Aries and is about 12 and a half light years away, making it the 24th nearest star to our sun. Now, as I'm going here, I'm showing you a little bit of an animation of our solar system and where Earth lies in that habitable zone and where these two new planets are orbiting this red dwarf, where they lie and also in that habitable zone. The, um, the, the red dwarf is also known as GAT 1370, and this star was discovered in 2003 by NASA astronomer Bonnard Teagarden and his colleagues. It has a mass of about 8% that of our sun, a radius of 10% solar, and a temperature of about 4,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it's pretty exciting that we're finding, basically in our backyard, exoplanets that resemble Earth in size and also in relation to their star. The... Um, God, Godigan University astronomer Matthias Zeckmeister said, We observed Tea Garden Star for three years, looking for periodic variations in its velocity. The data clearly shows the existence of two planets. They resemble the inner planets of our solar system, are only slightly heavier than Earth, and are located in the so-called habitable zone. Named Tea Garden Star B and C, respectively, the new planets have minimum masses of 1.05 and 1.1 Earth masses, respectively, and are among the lowest mass planets discovered so far. Both planets orbit inside the star's habitable zone. And what determines that is where we believe liquid water is possible. Although, because this is a red dwarf, much larger than our sun, um, one of the planets would need to have a rather special atmosphere in order to allow for water on its surface. Um, and I'm showing you a photo here of actually what the sun looks like from Earth and also what this sun, this red dwarf, would look like from these two planets. And one of them, it's very large in the sky. So water might be a little hard to come by on that planet. Their orbital periods are much longer than ours, too, uh, about 4.9 and 11.4 days for the two different planets of our days. Estimates put the system's age at about 8 billion years old, which is nearly twice as old as our own planet of our planet being 4.5 billion years old. The astronomers went on to say, incidentally, within a few decades, it would be easier for hypothetical intelligent beings on one of those planets to detect Earth than the other way around. Between the years of 2044 and 2496, Tea Garden Star will be positioned to see the solar system edge on, and its inhabitants should be able to detect Earth using the so-called transit method as they see our planet pass directly in front of the disk of our sun, the same way that we detected these planets passing through the disk of that red dwarf. And that really starts to make your mind go crazy when you start to think about the age of our solar system, the age of space itself, and then how we as humanity are just a blip on the, that incredibly long timeline of billions and billions of years. So hypothetically speaking, if there's intelligent life in the universe, some of it might have already blipped in and out of existence itself billions of years ago. 
And, you know, who's to say that our lifespan is lining up with another lifespan out there in the universe of some other intelligent life? But, hypothetically, if there is intelligent life on these habitable planets 12 and a half light years away, they could technically detect our planet in just a few decades. It's pretty pretty cool stuff and it makes you it makes you start thinking about how just how insignificant we are in the vastness of the universe